It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. My guest today is CEO Stephen Wakeling. Stephen is a wireless industry entrepreneur with a 10-year track record of developing disruptive, technology-powered services. He's the co-founder and CEO of Fobio LLC, a software development company that builds optimized software services to support wireless carriers and retailers. Stephen holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and is an alumnus of Harvard Business School. He's a journalist by education, a technologist at heart, and as an entrepreneur, he thrives on startup culture and his personal mission to build things better. Stephen Wakeling, welcome into the corner office. Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's great to have you here. And, you know, we always like to kind of start a little bit with the early years. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, where you grew up and uh, what, were your, what was your family life like? Yeah, I kind of grew up uh, all over the U.S. Uh, we moved uh, every several years. My dad was an engineer uh, in the kind of uh, defense uh, industry. So uh, kind of all over with from uh, from New York to, to uh, Virginia to California to Michigan. So almost like uh, a military uh, family in that respect. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> People that was, yeah, very much like that. Yeah. So uh, I kind of went to college in Michigan and that's kind of where my entrepreneurial, I think, uh, kind of journey really started. Yeah, cool. So dad was an engineer. Mom uh, worked at home. Was she also a university grad or what was her uh, career? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my dad uh, is is from Australia. Uh, and, ah, cool. uh, went to engineering school there. Uh, my mom grew up in West Virginia. She went to the University of North Carolina and got a degree in pharmacy. Uh, and then she uh, did a graduate year in Australia. And then my, my dad there. Got it. Uh, got and it. then they kind of came back to the U.S. to appease, uh, you know, my mother's parents. Uh, and, and ended up, you know, they came back for two years and ended up staying for, you know, basically forever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my mom worked part time as a pharmacist uh, when I was growing up. Uh, and they, yeah, so it's two uh, very science minded parents, uh, very into logic and reason. Sounds like it. Yeah. Brothers and sisters. Yeah, I have one younger brother. Uh, uh, he uh, lives in Shanghai, and he's a uh, oh. uh, you know entrepreneur in his own right, uh, and has he's been in uh, in China now for almost ten years. I think. So, wow. Uh, yeah, fluent uh, Mandarin speaker and, uh, you know, the pride of the family. Very international family in that respect. Yeah. T tell me a little bit about the influence your parents had. Uh, you know, were there some certain things you remember as a kid that, you know, were either pointed out to you or maybe uh, corrected behavior that uh, stuck with you over the years? <laughs> well, certainly, like, both of my parents were very studious. And I think that there was, uh, you know, a very, uh, uh, you know, a big emphasis put on education in our family. Uh, not one that I necessarily think rubbed off on me, but it was certainly the lesson was learned. I don't know if the uh, execution was there on my part, but um, they, I think uh, there was, uh, you know, my dad grew up in Australia, as I said, and he was, you know, had a very adventurous kind of outdoor high adventure kind of uh, uh, childhood. And he certainly kind of brought uh, uh, that to our childhood as well. And, you know, we did a lot of hiking and did, you know, a lot of uh, crazy stuff, climbing in caves and uh, rock climbing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, uh, and then obviously, you know, we were doing quite a bit of traveling cause, you know, we'd have to go to Australia to see, you know, the, the grandparents and, uh, yeah. So we kind of had uh, this idea, I think growing up that you could kind of do whatever you wanted as long as you planned it well enough. Uh, and then, you know, the, the idea of, you know, jumping on a plane and going halfway around the world, and, like being in a culture that you, was, you know, foreign to you was like something that, uh, you know, was exciting, not frightening. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, we both, my brother and I have like an aptitude for 
uh, kind of measured risk and and like a sense of an adventure. I think that's been really helpful yeah. certainly in my travel and adventure. Journey. Yeah. yeah, dual passports for the both of you. Uh, yeah, they're pretty uh, yeah handy at times. Nice, nice. I imagine growing up uh, and in and, and living in the number of places you did, uh, were there other early influencers, you know, any specific teachers or coaches that, uh, you know, kind of had a specific impact on you? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we moved uh, when I was in high school to Michigan, uh, which is kind of like a very entrepreneurial state in general. I think, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, uh, factories that are making brake pads and or coat hangers or something. And so there's a lot of people there who are kind of doing their own thing and, and very successful at it. Um, and I met a couple of people there who are still, you know, kind of mentors for me today. One person named Terry Hulse. Uh, he's kind of an operational guru and uh, you know, had kind of, you know, had a lot of experience growing big manufacturing companies. And, you know, he's a great guy to call when you're like, hey, you know, uh, the, the police <laughs> How do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, that's going to happen. For me. <laughs> yeah. So he's a kind of a master of what to do now and kind of high pressure situation. So uh, I think it was good. And, and then also we were just kind of uh, seeing people all the time, you know, in Michigan, at least uh, who were. Um, you know, had an idea and they were executing on it. And it was all about, uh, you know, a, a quality product and kind of being very uh, conservative with your growth estimation. So I had this weird kind of, uh, you know, juxtaposition of this kind of real world business where there's nothing wrong with making coat hangers every day and trying to make a dollar on each one. Uh, and then, you know, I lived in Southern or in, uh, Northern California when I was in uh, the early part of high school and middle school. Uh, so, you know, the Internet was happening at that time and we were just seeing the kind of very birth of, of uh, you know, not, it was this pre Google, but it was like the HPs and the 3M, that, that kind of stuff was happening out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly Apple. Uh, and so when I in college, you know, I was kind of addicted to the podcasts about like what was going on and, you know, this week in tech and like figuring out, like hearing about like, build the, this. The birth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The birth of the Facebooks and the Googles it was so fascinating. And so uh, Drew, who also is uh, from Michigan, and I am my business partner, uh, you, know, you, you know, we were like, man, well, let's, we wanted to be part of that. And as soon as we were able, uh, we kind of got out to Southern California and just wanted to work at various startups and kind of be part of that startup culture. And, you know, they're venture backed and, you know, they have this crazy expectations and, you know, earnings didn't matter. And so we carried with us this seed of like, it's okay to kind of grow at a sustainable rate. And, you know, you know, kind of Midwestern, Midwestern values, it sounds like, right? Some yeah. Conservatism exactly. there. Let, let's rewind a little bit because I want to do get more into that. But tell us a little bit about your, you know, kind of school years, uh, middle school, high school. Were you a good student, Stephen? I uh, know I was not. <laughs> <laughs> he says good, resolutely. <laughs> yeah, that is the one thing I know. Uh, I was, I think, a very curious uh, student uh -huh. and, and certainly like enjoyed learning. Uh, but yeah, I just didn't perform very well in like a typical kind of like academic environment. So I was like much more interested in coming home from school and trying to like invent a pet perpetual motion machine or, yeah. you know, blow so, stuff up with my chemistry set. So let's talk about some of those outside things. So, so obviously it's experimentation at home, sports, music, theater, any other type of thing that you're involved with, or was it mostly just messing around in the garage? There was a lot of messing around in the garage. You know, we were, I was pretty uh, heavily involved in Boy Scouts. Uh, so I was an Eagle Scout. So there was a lot of like high adventure stuff that was happening on the weekends. And certainly at that time in the kind of Northern California and Michigan are great states to be outdoors in pretty right. much all the time. Right. And uh, then my other kind of like passion, I think it was uh, theater and improv. So I was on the improv team at my high school and like was in a, a number of different plays. And I think like improvisation and I kind of was uh, fascinated with it and like kind of studying like Second City stuff. And a lot of my friends ended up going down that path. But I think it, like improv theater was like a great training ground for uh, the early part in, like, when you're selling a product Absolutely, that doesn't quite yeah. exist yet. <laughs> right, <laughs> It's right. very helpful to be able to improvise. Attracting money and funds. Yeah, yeah. Those speaking skills are awesome. What about entrepreneurial things growing up? You know, did you have the paper route? Did you sell, you know, greeting cards at Christmas time? Or were there things that you did for extra spending money? What were some of those things? We were always doing something. It really kind of kicked up when I was in college. When I was in uh, high school, we're focused on the bands. And so, you know, you'd have uh, three or four people in a band and you'd be creating like a kind of web site and the logo and then you'd be like making stickers and going out very kind of like band oriented because you know we we're trying to attract girls and that's like the way that we <laughs> thought that that's work but uh so and when i got to college it like my roommates and i were always doing something we had uh we were brewing our own beer in the basement of this house we lived in and we're selling it you know with 
totally illegally, I'm sure. And we had this brand that was called Bleer and we, we put the L in beer and had like, you know, a, a <laughs> hundred different taglines of uh, various degrees of hilarity. For Did us you go the to the University of Michigan? Was that? Uh... No, I went to a small school called Central Michigan University, um, which is essentially in the in the middle of a big cornfield, and so uh, you know, there's not much to do except for to make your own fun. So uh, you know, certainly was a challenge to do that. Uh, and you know, we were just always. Was it kind of a foregone conclusion that you'd go to college with mom and dad having done so themselves? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There was not, uh, you know, whatever college we could, I could get into. It was basically, <laughs> right. that was the, I was going there. And what did you decide to study in college? So I was interested in broadcasting and journalism. Uh, so I ended up getting a degree in, uh, in journalism and a kind of broadcasting film uh, with, a, with a minor in history, uh, which has uh, served me well. Yeah. And were there some jobs that you worked uh, during those years or was it all kind of entrepreneurial stuff uh, to earn the spending money, so to speak? So I was always doing something like we had, uh, you know, making silly putty, but calling it classy putty and then selling <laughs> it online or doing something crazy like that. But none of it was very it was all uh, creatively fulfilling, but not very financially fulfilling. OK, so I had a slew of crazy jobs. Most summers, I worked as a forest ranger uh, at the in a, a state park in, in Michigan. That was a, probably one of my better jobs. Uh, but uh, I also the outdoorsm was like, coming in again. Right? Yeah, I mean, just being paid to drive around in a pickup truck, you know, was like, wow, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I also was a uh, for the I worked several different jobs, mostly in IT for the university I went to. Uh, but I also was a seeing eye person. Uh, where I was like the personal assistant to a uh, seeing impaired uh, professor in the, in the philosophy and religion oh, department. Oh, that's uh, very yeah, interesting. I got to, yeah, hang out with him all day and, you know, and, uh, you know, read his mail to him and, you know, hang out with his dad. It was, it, was a, it was kind of a cool job. Was that a paid position or something yeah. you volunteered to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was paid a university gig. Uh, yeah, so I had a bunch of crazy jobs uh, kind of uh, through school. And I always had a job and was always doing something. I don't know that I would call it an entrepreneurial pursuit or only, only kind of looking back. It was always just kind of zany, some zany, might be a business, might be a performance art project. <laughs> right. Might <laughs> be reading mail. On. All right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> what was that first job out of college then that you took? Or did you go right into your entrepreneurial uh, activities? I actually did go straight. I uh, left uh, Michigan and I, I, I was kind of interested to get as far away from home as I possibly could. So I, I went to Australia and I, I uh, worked at an event management company doing IT there. Uh, and then I had kind of like a, a, a small uh, IT business where I was basically just like fixing people's computers and stuff like that in the, in the Brisbane uh, area. Um, and I did that for the better part of a year uh, until I kind of decided to come home and, you know, you know get a real job. Uh, <laughs> and I thought that would just be as easy. And I had this fun adventure and I'll just go get my kind of nine to five corporate job now. Uh, and I ended up coming back and working at a, um, a recording studio that uh, that had um, that their, their business was doing um, audiobooks. So they just recorded audiobooks all day long, um, which was while I was there, they were acquired by Amazon. Oh, <laughs> so interesting. I okay. kind of like moved and, uh, you know, recording audiobooks was, you know, not as not as thrilling as you as you might think, like romance <laughs> novels and stuff. Right. So right. I had kind of uh, parlayed that into a job writing um, the backs of the, the book, basically. Like, this is the greatest audiobook ever, says Stephen Wakeling, that kind of stuff. Basic copywriting, advertising copywriting. And uh, so when we were acquired by, the company was acquired by Amazon, I immediately went to California and basically was like advertising copywriter, Amazon. <laughs> wow. So, so you uh, stayed with and, the company, did you? you no, I, I had left, uh, but I had kind of referenced instead of saying, you know, this recording studio that nobody had ever heard of. It was a strange set of circumstances that uh, my friend Drew, his dad had an apartment in LA that he had vacated and there was some time left on the lease. And he basically said, if any, if you paid I told Drew, if you paid the maintenance fees, he could live there until the lease ended. So of course, like five of us went out there and we're sharing a one bedroom apartment, splitting the rent. I remember like, you know, a hundred dollars a month. Oh my God. Uh, but, uh, I wanted to work at a startup and kind of found, I didn't also did not, this is a, a Hermosa beach area. So we, uh, I didn't want to commute. So I just kind of found a startup that was as nearby, uh, the apartment as I could. And I found this weird place in Torrance and just kind of walked in and, uh, was able to, uh, you know, she was, uh, I basically was talking to the, the receptionist 
Uh, and you know, they're like, where is leveraging your Amazon credentials, right? That's right. <laughs> I thought, I really thought I was going to lean hard on those, but she, I told him I would do whatever it took, you know, like whether it's customer service or sweeping up or writing press releases. And, uh, so they asked me about my, the receptionist asked me, and I won't let tell me about yourself. And I was like, well, I was born in West Virginia <laughs> and that was all she needed to know. Uh, turned out she was from West Virginia and so was the CEO of the company. Oh my goodness. Uh, and so they wow. were like, oh yeah. Kismet. So it's like t- 10 minutes later, they're like, Hey, we want to give you a job, but we don't have a phone or a laptop for you. And I was like, well, I have a laptop and a phone. I'll just, you know, and they're like, oh, sit right here. So, oh, that's uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> and it that's was you know, very much like a, you know, fast paced startup environment where they hardly knew what they were doing from day to day. So like the least they could worry about was what I was doing. So, but it was fun. How long did you stay with that startup? Uh, I was there for uh, the better part of three years, two and a half years. Yeah. And did you move into managing people there? You know, any early leadership experience? I had a totally bizarre role that could not have been more appropriate for kind of where I was heading. Um, so my my job uh, from about day one was called, uh, my job title was the X Factor. And my job description was to find and solve problems by whatever means necessary. Uh, and I, there was a piece of paper that that was written on in a file somewhere in the HR office. So I kind of, I didn't have any direct reports, but I also didn't really have any purview. I was kind of like a executive problem solver at large. Rover, uh, so, right. Yeah. yeah. So if, whether it was like figuring out like a technical issue or uh, trying to refine the customer service process or going and checking out a facility or they, uh, somebody just signed up in Canada can somebody go set up a Canadian business. Hmm. So it was just kind of, and I reported to the CEO, which kind of gave me a lot of, uh, really uh, cool, you know, yeah. yeah. Insights. And it was, yeah, it was great. It was, was it, it was kind like of things that kind human. of things that uh, other people didn't want to do, or it was kind of more of nobody else had time to do. So, you know, let's yeah, go figure it, was, it out. It was, I operated primarily in the gaps. It was things like in a, so, so it was like as a, a startup company that was growing quickly, there was always stuff that was kind of showing up on the doorstep of, you know, like things that needed to be done that didn't fall neatly into the kind of uh, uh, kind of various disciplines. Like there, this isn't really a marketing thing and it really isn't a biz dev thing. So uh, I kind of would just pick up whatever project I would and with just, you know, no, there was no reason that I should be doing any of this stuff, but they were letting me do it. And it was like a fantastic training ground. And, great job. you know, obviously, you know, like it was got to be kind of like a mini chief of staff without a lot of consequence. Yeah. What were some of the early lessons you took from that position? You being there for three years, you, you obviously had a lot of uh, exposure and I'm sure some successes as well as failures. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, I learned a lot about how to get things done inside a corporate structure. Like I had done a lot of things, um, and there was very little corporate structure there, but there was some. So, like, I had a lot of experience getting things done with a small group of my friends, and that was pretty easy. And like, we all could just do it. But like, kind of helping people understand like what you're doing and what you're where you're going with it. And as the company got bigger, kind of like helping you know the vice president of marketing understand that I wasn't stepping on his toes. I was trying to like help him out. You know, so it kind of really uh, it helped me kind of you know, identify how important diplomacy is kind of within an organization and also uh, how to kind of build a case, like an influential case for doing something, you know, like previously, like I would have just thought, well, this seems like a good idea. Let's just, I'm just going to do it. And like, uh, kind of, I really learned there how to kind of build like a real business case and sell it internally to kind of create. Yeah. Real important. Yeah. So uh, do you remember the first time you started managing people? Was it at this company or was it a little later on? So tell us about that. Yeah, it was really like I I had had no direct reports in a job uh, up until I started the company. Uh, I had had a lot of kind of leadership experience, like strangely enough, in the Boy Scouts. uh, And like most of my uh, kind of summer jobs and uh, kind of like the, you know, whatever my after school jobs that I had in college were almost all management positions. So I'd had 25 or 30 reports in a totally, you know, responsibility free zone almost. Uh, but it was a great way to kind of figure out like what's important and, you know, like how to kind of talk to people about raises and that kind of stuff. So I had a little bit of kind of people management experience, but yeah, it wasn't really until uh, we started Fobio that like I had any real experience doing that. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. What what were some of the best and the worst lessons you've learned from previous bosses? Man, that's a good, I've, I've, uh, I've had some good bosses and I've had some bad bosses. Bad. <laughs> you don't have to mention uh, any names on the lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think I, you know, I've learned a lot. Um, 
uh, I worked for a really great guy in New Orleans who kind of showed me like how important it is to, to, to just get it. Like execution was his big thing. He was very kind of well organized uh, and could get things done extremely fast. And I remember just like almost not even being like I was just awestruck kind of like working for him to see how quickly he could kind of move through a series of tasks because he kind of organized his whole day around doing it. He was uh, it was really kind of like, uh, you know, whatever, like getting things done. David Allen kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know that he was into that, but he certainly was uh, uh, kind of representing it. Um, and I think, you know, certainly I've had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, great bosses who were open uh, and uh, kind of transparent about like what needed to get done and kind of like provided goals that weren't just uh, tactical in nature. Like I like always preferred it when people gave me like a strategic direction and like how I got there was kind of up to me. And I think uh, the, the bosses that I've had in the past or the managers that I've had in the past who have I've been less successful under tended to kind of be in this, you know, like you don't need to know that. Mm, and I'm telling yeah, you what to do yeah, and you just right. execute. So um, I have always tried to kind of like err on the other side of that is, you know, like tell people where we're going. And then, you know, like I, you, you guys help me understand what the best way to get there. Is. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, current company, then let's get up to speed. Uh, Phobio has been about 10 years in the making. Is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, almost coming up on nine. Yeah. Awesome. And how many employees today? Uh, today, 75. 75. Great. And how would you say your leadership's, you know, style has kind of evolved over time, particularly since uh, starting your own gig? My, well, so we are kind of uh, started as a bootstrapped uh, organization and kind of grew to beyond $100 million, uh, you know, without the capital partnership. So it was basically just me and thank you, uh, basically me and just the co-founders uh, uh, having to kind of figure it out as we went along. And I think we learned pretty quickly that you didn't have to be right all the time. You just had to be right most of the time. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, we were always constantly trying to hire people who were uh, smarter than us, who knew a lot more about us. And then, and the kind of all we felt like, like our, uh, our goal was to kind of like hold on to the cultural sensibility, you know, and like, and, and, uh, kind of be focused on strategy and culture rather than the, you know, being kind of controlling around how we do things. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's like the lessons that I have learned over the past nine years is, uh, it's, it would be, you, I could fill nine books probably. <laughs> well, you, you've mentioned a whole lot of things and I kind of want to unpack them a little bit. Uh, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about the people and so forth. Um, you had mentioned, um, you know, obviously hiring people that are smarter than you, not having to be the smartest person in the room, you know, tell me a little bit about some of the things that you do as it relates to, you know, kind of identifying key people for the organization. Do you, do you have, you know, a mission statement, a vision statement? You know, how do you kind of recruit against the people you want to bring in? Yeah, we have had a really good, uh, we've had a lot of good luck hiring great people. And I, it's, I have thought a lot about how we ended up finding these great people. But I think that it, it really comes down to our openness about how we do things. Uh, and our kind of like intellectual curiosity about solving the problem. Like we didn't often come into situations saying, look, we know exactly what to do. Just do what we say and everything will be great. We, we kind of always in our kind of uh, in uh, kind of opening conversations with new hires, we'd say like, look, this is where we're at. This is where we've come from. And this is where we want to get to. And we think that it's possible. And like even just like in an interview setting, you know, people are kind of get really uh, the right people, I guess, uh, get really inquisitive and excited about the opportunity. Uh, and like, you know, they start throwing out ideas, how we can do that. So we've kind of had this very collaborative kind of problem solving focused culture. It's really easy to communicate in an interview. I think, um, you know, we have had a bias toward action uh, and we want everybody to feel comfortable being the, their genuine self. And I think those are things that are I, we've I, I, and this is all kind of like in retrospect. I don't think we did any of this uh, intentionally. <laughs> Years you of know? learning, I'm sure. Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think like, you know, in, uh, you know, in a recruiting kind of phase, it's easy to kind of in a conversation, get those things across without actually saying that you're doing those things. Like, I think that just generally the people at Phobio have been very agile, flexible, like intellectually curious problem solvers who really like getting things done. And I think those five things are really attractive to people who are just like that out in the world. So Do you personally uh, get involved in a lot of the hiring or only for your direct reports or maybe one level down? You know, what's kind of your interaction there? I don't get involved in everybody's hiring, but most people I'll meet at some point. 
Uh, so normally, like, I, I don't know that I would say I would have like a sign off kind of on everybody, but they'll certainly be uh, interacting in, in their first several years. Yeah, it was every single person was like I was recruiting and it would be unusual for somebody to come along. And there was a lot of referrals and like, hey, you should meet this guy. And we met, you know, but um, yeah, certainly like I found that to be pretty important to have um, at least, a you know, uh, uh, you, you kind of get that feeling when you meet somebody. There's that kind of indescribable something that's there that you're like, yeah, this guy's going to be great. So, uh, well, yeah, if you only have actually, a few, if you only have a few minutes with someone, what, what do you typically ask them? What do you zero in on? Um, I think, you know, I, I, I tend to kind of like read all the information that I have on the person. So you're like, look through the LinkedIn profile, maybe you review their resume. And then I kind of like try to forget all of that stuff. Um, and then the interview is generally just kind of like, so <laughs> like, what's, uh, what do you do? What do you like to do? What's like, what, do, where, what, what did you like about what you were doing before? This is what we've got going on. Um, what do you think about that? So it's like ends up being kind of like, like a really fast paced conversation. Um, and, you know, I always love to hear about like what people, are, you know, what is, is the unknown exciting is like the idea that there isn't a lot of uh, there may not, you know, and this doesn't work for every job, but like, uh, you know, there's not a lot of uh, there's no how to manual for this job. Like, if, is that a positive or a negative? And, you know, we kind of tend to err on the, the people who think, like, oh, that's great. I get to write my own job description in some regard and, and we don't have the system in place to measure this so I can define what that is. So the people who have done really well at Fobio, I think, like really embrace that. And, and, you know, I think every interview is a little different, but they're all basically just like a conversation. And I think my number one question is trying to like assess, you know, w- you know, whether you're excited to be here <laughs> and like, is this something that you, that you want to do this with us, you know? Uh, and I think being very upfront about like the challenges ahead is super important too. Like we don't want people to feel like, oh, well, this is like a super high growth company and it's just going to be fun every day. And we kind of feel like the the problem solving is the fun part, but not everybody sees it that way. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're being really open about that on the front end. Stephen, how do you decide if it's time to micromanage or, you know, when to stay out of someone's sandbox? That is a real challenge, I think, for any uh, bootstrapped entrepreneur. I think you get to get it off the ground. You end up doing so much of like this pace setting, you know, like, where, you know, if it's not going well, you immediately have to get involved because like, you know, it's uh, uh, when you're growing a company and especially like in, the, in a bootstrap fashion, you know, you don't have a lot of margin for error. And I think it's really difficult for the entrepreneurs that have bootstrap companies to kind of get out of that mode of pace setting. Um, so, you know, I, I try really hard not to micromanage. And like when I find things that are going off the rails, try to like, you know, how can I communicate in like an upstream fashion? uh, where we need to get to, or what, how can I change some things that are going to make the dynamic of this, like, uh, the group or the problem different. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I think like, uh, I don't think of myself as a micromanager. Uh, I'm pretty like, you know, open and, and I, I like people to be collaborative and, and, you know, I want people with new ideas to be tried out and I don't want to like hamper any of that. But yeah, I think like it's more and more, I realize how much of the that kind of pace setting, let me get involved and let me fix it right now because I know I can do it, how much of that I really do. And it's like, I think it's a challenge for any entrepreneur as you, as you grow to let go of some of the responsibility. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's key because you've got to be able to delegate and have other people do that job. And it's sometimes very difficult to recognize when you're doing it. So I think, you know, uh, kind of working on, you know, there's some really basic techniques around mindfulness and kind of self-awareness. Because I don't think like entrepreneurs are always uh, aware. Uh, certainly, I wasn't aware that I was doing it on a many of occasions. So, you talked earlier a little bit about company culture. You know, what are your thoughts on building a, a strong company culture? I think it's really important. I think um, a lot of people probably know that it's important, and so they say that it's important. So, I think you really have to kind of do a, uh, a, a certainly as an entrepreneur who's founding something. I think as early on as you can make a cultural assessment of yourself, like what are the things that you truly believe in? And I think like you need to kind of start with like a basic fabric of what is important to you and like what is it that makes you want to come to work every day? And I think distilling your motive is is the earlier you do that, the, the more important I think it is. So I think you like you for me, I you know, had been in this uh, master's program where I was doing philosophy and religion. 
And so I had like kind of thought like philosophically about the things that were important to me at an early, you know, when I was like in my early twenties and it was a really basic list and it had to do with kind of open and honest communication and, you know, enjoying what I do. Uh, and the, with the, these are the kind of things that led me to an entrepreneurial pursuit, you know, wanting to do stuff that like was important to me. Um, and so I think like the early you can kind of create that list, uh, you know, and I really things that like really you, you, you might fight and die for kind of thing if you if you were to lose them. I think the, the earlier you can figure that out, the easier it is for you to identify what your culture is. And I think the more you like believe it and the more serious you are about those things the easier it is for you to convey them emphatically and the easier it is for people to adopt them around you. So I think oftentimes like a mistake that cultures make is or companies making culture is like, well, we're going to have fun. <laughs> <We're> gonna, <laughs> and like it, it be, they become these really vague concepts that I think are hard for people to, to connect to. And I think they're the, they're the easy ones that kind of everybody wants to have fun and you yeah. know, do yeah. important things, you know, but. Well, it sounds like you really believe that culture does flow from the CEO or the founder or the owner. Is that correct? Yeah. And I think like what I found is that culture can be like a delivery system. They're like, I think it's an afterthought. You know, people say that, you know, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you're, the people in your organization are the most important thing. And like the culture is kind of what really binds them together. And I think, you know, I see kind of culture and policy as kind of being having this kind of tension in the relationship where you want people to kind of define a culture that helps people make decisions so that you don't have to have a bunch of policies around, uh, you know, what people are doing. So like, I think it can be a really important delivery system for the hard stuff. I think a lot of people think it's just like foosball tables in the lobby and free sodas <laughs> or whatever. So what would you say is unusual or, or unique about Fovio's culture, Stephen? I think that um, we have a really inclusive culture um, where everybody feels comfortable uh, to be them themselves. And that's like an important part of, of our kind of the problem solving, you know, like, we, uh, you know, ideas are the only thing that really matter around here and they can kind of come from anywhere. We've had the, you know, like they, they it's, a, it is amazing. Like when you open up uh, the problem to, to everyone, you know, you don't say like, well, this is an engineering problem. Only engineers can consider this, you know, like when you kind of open it up to everybody, it's amazing where the solutions can come from. Uh, and also like we open up uh, uh, a lot of a reporting to everyone because, uh, you know, the sometimes Are you kind of that, an open book finance company is it in that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, we feel like, you know, as certainly as, you know, uh, business is kind of evolving, uh, you know, and there's certainly more millennials in the workforce today than there were yesterday. Uh, I think like there's this. <laughs> and there'll uh, be more tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Exactly. <laughs> And I think there's this kind of need to know uh, uh, kind of uh, directive, I think, at some companies. And I think like more and more millennials kind of need to know everything, you know. So and I think in the, there's a lot of data to show the more information that you expose, like the more valuable the, your team can become as a problem solving force. Yeah. Yeah. No, very key. Good. Uh, Stephen, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much. You know, there's one last question we like to ask everyone who's on our show is, you know, what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone who's got their eyes on their own corner office or, or perhaps in your case, you know, wants to be an entrepreneur, found a company and, and you know, build a hundred million dollar business? Wow. I think uh, for anybody out there who's thinking about starting a company or doing something, I, I think that you absolutely should. Uh, I'm a big proponent of being conservative. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, for, for me, I was trying to save all the money that I possibly could in my twenties so that I would have the opportunity, uh, to, to start a company and do something that I truly wanted to do. And I think that, you know, uh, it, it felt like a very risky thing to be doing, but like, ultimately I think it was probably, you know, one of the best investments that I ever made. It was in myself. And I think you have to have like a self-awareness. Like I think, you know, uh, an appetite for risk is really important. Um, but you know, I would caution any would be entrepreneur to like really make a, a strong assessment about, you know, what the, the idea that they're chasing and like whether it is going to pay out or not. And I think, you know, it, it's okay to say like, you know what, I don't think, I don't see this. We had a ton of ideas that were, you know, in the first six weeks of working on them, like, I don't see this going anywhere. And, you know, having the, the, the kind of the, uh, the, uh, we're being comfortable enough to say, I'm going to just go ahead and put this one down and try something new here. Uh, I think that that's an important thing. But then like once you have something that you think has some legs, not stopping. You know, I think one of the most important kind of uh, pieces of advice I ever got was from my 
uh, business partner, Drew. And when we started the Phobio, he said, let's just do this until it's bankrupt <laughs> or successful. <laughs> or and, it's not fun like, anymore. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think, you know, we'd had a lot of uh, kind of ideas that had been like, nah, this is kind of cool, but maybe we'll try something else. And uh, he was like, let's just try one until it, until it tells us we're done. <laughs> right. There you go. And I think, you know, that, uh, you know, certainly a year in, you know, when we're just starting to get our first revenue, I think, uh, you know, it, there was a million opportunities in that first year to go out and, you know, get a real job or <laughs> do something else. <laughs> and I think just having this, like, I felt a little bit dared <laughs> right. Drew to right. not do that. And I think that was probably one of the keys to our success. Well, congratulations on your success. You know, 10 years together in a partnership is a challenge in any situation, but growing a great business and lots of opportunities for the future is certainly very encouraging. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.